Lewis Cunningham is a good pilot, but he has a big problem. If it can't be sorted and soon, he'll never make it as a fast jet pilot. This is a story of a year in the life of a group of pilots as they try to fulfill their ultimate dream. For the first time in 25 years, we've been allowed into RAF Valley on Anglesey to film the highs and lows of the fast jet pilots of tomorrow. Today is the start of teaching you to take an aircraft as a weapon and go out and kill somebody with it. At ground school, they got to grips with the intricacies of the Hawk jet and endured survival training. At 208 Squadron, they've passed the first big hurdle, flying the jets solo. But the road ahead for these trainee pilots is long and hard. Not all of them will make it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. For the trainee pilots, the new year starts with bad news. The war with Iraq looks inevitable, and a death has particular significance for 208 Squadron. The man said to be the last surviving fighter pilot from the First World War dies at the remarkable age of 106. A painting at Valley celebrates the courage of Henry Bottrell. He flew with 208. In Bottrell's lifetime, man had gone from gliding a few feet to the fast jets of today. Jet flying is a punishing physical experience, and it's this simple fact that could get between Lewis Cunningham and his dream of becoming a fighter pilot. Um, well, they've taken me off the off the course because of uh, air sickness, which is a problem I've had at times so far in my flying training. But it's uh, it's come back to bite me rather more severely here. In the crushing turns, gravity can jump eightfold, ramming you into your seat. Blood drains from the head. Just breathing is hard. The human body was not designed to tolerate these extremes. Well, for me, it's, it's motion sickness. It's caused by the um, imbalance between what your eyes tell you is happening and what your inner ears and your stomach sense is happening. Once the wheels are on the ground, I usually feel, feel better. but in, in the air it affects me really badly. As soon as my concentration goes, because I'm thinking about feeling ill, then I can't fly accurately and, and all, the, all the other thinking things that we need to do when we fly just disappear and I'm, and I'm unable to concentrate on, on the sortie. I think it's very hard for them, but I think it's important that, that we as instructors make it, make it clear to them that it's the best thing they can do is admit that problem early so that we can take steps for them to overcome it because there's nothing worse than, than somebody like Lewis coming here with good potential, showing a, a good ability and his, his performance starting to suffer because he's not feeling 100%. Lewis is stopped from flying. The decision is made to send him to Farnborough for a gruelling desensitisation course in the hope that that will cure the problem. If we can make sure that we can cure the problem once and for all, then we'll do that. And uh, there will come a time where if it continues to recur, then we're just going to have to turn around and say, I'm sorry, Lewis, fast jet flying isn't for you.
Lewis's career is in the balance. How he reacts to the air sickness cause will dictate his future. Leaving Valley, though, also means leaving behind close friends who carry on without him. It's disappointing for anybody to, to be stunted in their training, to have to go off and take a couple of months out of training um, before sort of pursuing it again. You're sort of putting your career on hold a little bit. But I mean, I think with the problem that he was having, he, he had accepted to himself quite openly and, and to everybody else. He said, oh, you know, I've got a problem with it and, and I want to nip it in the bud now. And better to do it now than to get onto the front line and then flag it up and say, actually, I'm not really enjoying this. And, you know. It's a shame to see him go. And uh, but I think he's made the right decision. Yeah. He's got to sort of grip it and get himself sorted out. Lewis is placed in the sickness bin on the pilots and official course board. The other pilots, though, are doing well. Mark Baker is first to cross the halfway hurdle, called the progress check. And done. Woo! Yeah! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> the course is relentless, and the trainee pilots now begin to learn to fly in formation and the rudiments of precision navigation when you're flying at seven miles a minute. Weight squadron is a place of two halves. On the top floor, the pilots in green. 30,000 troops, that's a quarter of the British Army, are on their way to the Gulf to stand by for possible action. Downstairs, the engineers in blue. Out to the Gulf for a possible war with Iraq is much higher than expected. <laughs> in many ways, they are two separate worlds that meet briefly on the flight line, but each is vital to the other. Kit for Dobsey, 174, dual and full of fuel, please. The engineers and flight line mechanics are not part of the RAF. They're local civilians who work for a private contractor. Whilst we focus on pilots, we should not underestimate the value of all the other people. We're in this as a team. Servicemen, civilians and contractors, you know, we're all in this together, preparing people to be the future of our service. Pilots are important, but in all honesty, no engineers, no aircraft to fly, you may as well not bother with the pilots. After four years at Valley, Emma Corbett wants to become an engineer. She's applied for the training, she's been assessed, and today she'll find out the result. Outstanding punctuality, often arriving well before shift, start times and commencing work immediately. Very good with hand tools, has displayed a keen interest in the propulsion trade over the past two and a half years and is always keen to assist whenever possible. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Are you surprised? Um, I was hoping for it quite a lot, but now I've, I've actually got it, it's a bit of a step back, really. Um, I'm quite pleased with the marks that I have got. Um, I was also told as well that um, it's the highest marks um, that somebody's got for things that were on there, so I was quite, quite chuffed with it, really. So top of the group? Yeah. <laughs> this is the Rolls-Royce Ardor twin shaft turbofan engine. If Emma is to qualify as an engineer, she'll have to get to know it inside out in the next nine months. Until now, she's worked as a liney on the flight line. The number of sorties flown each day depends on how quickly she can complete the mechanical checks. Basically, they're the customer. Um, we're just here to help them get through their courses, really. Um, you know, we try our best. Uh, sometimes we're short-staffed, but we work quite hard just to try and get those aircraft up and flying and serviceable for them. Ten years ago, RAF Valley was behind wire, largely cut off from the local community. Now, 800 civilians work here. Everybody on the base works with one aim, to get the fast jet pilots up into the air for training. RAF pilots are used as frontline troops and peacekeepers around the world. The demand for these new pilots has never been greater. got 
to be prepared to fly away from the fixed bases that I was used to, uh, to anywhere in the world and conduct operations at very short notice, depending on the political will of, of our masters. So we have to train the individual now to be extremely flexible. Uh, flexibility of thought, flexibility of operation. Uh, you will see from previous conflicts in Kosovo, Bosnia, the yeah. Gulf, and yeah. so on and so on, how different things are. Will we need to fly at low level? Will we need to fly at high level? What sort of combat operations? No one can answer those questions. So the training burden has got much bigger. The war against Iraq has begun with missile and airstrikes on Baghdad. American sources say senior Iraqi leaders, including Saddam Hussein, were targeted. The Gulf War has little direct effect on day-to-day -day life at Valley. The training continues regardless. People are obviously very aware of it, of it going on and uh, keeping abreast of, of, sort of things that are happening. But, um, the trouble is on the squadron, the, sort of the workload is always fairly high. We're going through the navigation phase. And uh, the amount of work required in the squadron is pretty huge at that point. And so you're really focusing on a quite a sort of selfish personal level, just focusing on your next trip. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we don't have the TV on all the time. We haven't got the radio on to, to the news channels. You know, we're pretty much just listening to, to music when we're trying to relax just before, before flying and things like that. So, switch one bit of your brain off and just dedicate yourself solely to what you're about to do in the aircraft and then you can go back to concerning yourself on what's, what's happening over there. Obviously we're following all the events with, with interest as anyone does, but for us it's more a get to the next stage, stepping stone type process we're going through. It's finish 2-8 squadron, go on to the next course type thing. So we're quite far removed down the chain, if you like, from frontline operations anywhere in the world. A couple from Krakauer in Powys are mourning the loss of their son who has been killed in Iraq. RAF navigator David Reese Williams died at the weekend when an American anti-aircraft -anti missile battery shot down his tornado by mistake. The pilot, Flight Lieutenant Kevin Barry Main, also died. They were returning to Kuwait after a mission over Iraq. Four days after the conflict begins, anti-war protesters break into the base and bring the flying to a halt. The protesters chain themselves to the end of the runway. North Wales police are brought in to help remove the protesters and escort them from the base. There are many people who feel very strongly about this war in Iraq. There is a connection between the use of Welsh land, the use of Welsh airspace and the training of these pilots who will go out then and use their skills in dropping bombs on the people of Iraq. Thank you for your cooperation. The pilots are not immune to the growing opposition to the war in Iraq. It's a fairly sombering time. I mean, there are people out there I know who went through officer training with me, and they're you know they're now deployed. Part of me thinks, yeah, it'd be it'd be great to be out there, be be part of the experience. But on the other hand, I mean, I don't think anyone wants to go to war, especially one that's you know, a conflict that's so patently unpopular at home. That, that can't be filling the, the troops with much confidence. Lewis has just arrived in Farnborough for his air sickness course. It's make or break time for Lewis. The doctors strap him into machines that simulate the motion he experiences while flying. They'll take him to the point where he feels sick, then back off, and then take him to that point again and again until he builds up a tolerance. The trick is not to make them so terribly unwell that they vomit or even that they feel terribly sick, just to get to the stage where they're not feeling too good, and then stop, and then come back another time, and start again. 
yeah. after. Do you want a drink or anything? Half an hour, 45 minutes, it, it starts to make you feel just a little bit dizzy, a little bit stomach aware, as we say, but nothing more than that. In the past, when the Air Force was much less of a, um, should we say, accommodating place than it is now, there was very much a culture that, you know, if you feel you feel sick, you're in some way, you know, not as, not as tough, not as hard as, as, as the other boys. I've got to make a stand, if you like, against my own physiology. It's just a small, cloth-covered revolving box. But it's this that has exposed the symptoms that could end Lewis's dreams of becoming a fighter pilot. Forward. Return. I hate this woman with a passion. Back. The doctors here boast that this machine can make anyone sick. Right. While spinning, Lewis must systematically move his head Return. forwards, backwards and to the side. Left. As the speed increases, the effect is similar to doing Return. aerobatics. You're not aware of spinning, but as the fluid in the semicircular canal slows down, you, you could be spinning at, at tremendous speed and just be not aware of it at all until you Return. move your head and then you get a very, very strange tumbling sensation. Back. What symptoms? A bit of tumbling on the left and right, and uh, a bit bodily warm. Return. The aim of it is to provoke the symptoms, right. and then for the body to adapt, but without going too far Return. down the, the road towards actual vomiting. Rape symptoms. Two. That's my nemesis. Yeah. That's what needs beating. But I think I'm on the way. I think I'm on the way to, to getting over it. Starboard, it's spring on Anglesey and the training yeah. continues. 90 starboard, 90 starboard, go. Mark and Rich are learning the complexities of battle turns. Shackle. 45, my avoid. 45. Tricking, tackling, Sala. This is totally new to all of us, so uh, we're going to get out on the bikes and find out what it's all about. It's just a way of turning to, to stay more defensive than fighting wing formation, which is what we've done before. So it's a much wider formation and it requires slightly more intricate patterns in the sky when you're, when you're making turns. On the front line, they, they use battle quite a lot. And uh, this sort of thing is going to be bread and butter, because when we're going off on uh, training missions and things, we'll be going as pairs. Uh, less and less a singleton, so we'll be going in in battle, which is this 2,000 yard spacing formation. And at those turns, we'll be doing all the time. I'm on the grass here. <laughs> Up to this point, the pilots have just been learning how to fly a plane. Now they begin to train for battle situations. From day one, the pilots are forced to face up to the realities of war. Today is the start of teaching you to fly an aeroplane as a weapon system. Today is the start of teaching you to take an aircraft as a weapon and go out and kill somebody with it. Now, that's a hard Despite the change in, in political scenarios, the fundamentals of combat haven't changed throughout the ages, that they will one day have to go out and use their aircraft as a weapon system. Yeah. And if they haven't thought about it at this time of their training, it's time they did. Can you kill somebody with your plane? Two years down the line on the front line, yes. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to. Um, it's difficult to say what you think about it. Um, rest assured, you know that wherever you're being sent, you're being sent by people who've far more experience and knowledge of the situation into which you're being sent. Um, and you know that it's going to be justified. I mean, I think obviously we keep in touch with what's going on ourselves so that we know if, if it's a just war, a just battle. I like to be sort of seen as someone who, instead of reading the paper in the morning, go, well, he's a very bad man, something should be done about him. You know, I'm actually going to be involved in the process and go and actually, actually do it. But I mean, that's sort of the question of, you know, I, I, are you going to be able to go and kill someone? You, I don't think you know until the first time you strap into an aircraft with live ordnance with a real target. And then I think you're going to go, hmm. So this is what it's going to feel like. But. 
night flying is a crucial part of pilot training at Valley. By April 2003, the RAF were flying 200 sorties a day in Iraq, the vast majority at night. A lot of the modern battle, modern warfare is, is still done at night. It's kind of, it's, it's the oldest form of defense, I suppose, darkness. And um, against a lot of the enemies that we're sort of coming across, I think it's still the best one because of the lowest sort of maybe sophistication of some of the defenses they've got. The weirdest thing is, you know, when you fly around, you know there are mountains around. I think, well, I can see stuff, but I can't see mountains. So, you fly at height that you know you're going to be above them. The constant bombing of Baghdad again forces the pilots to focus their minds on the idea of fighting and killing. Every sortie they now fly has taken on a new significance. We're flying towards, uh, towards Liverpool just to uh, a practice diversion. We're just going to fly around the instrument pattern and then, um, and then come back here again. And he just said, oh, look at that. It's a massive orange street lighting in front of us. That could be Baghdad in you know, two years' time, you know, flying towards Baghdad to find that, you know, the power station or whatever. And uh, he said, you know, what's the difference? There's nothing. It's pitch dark and there's a whole lot of street lighting. This could be exactly the same. Don't blame me. Increased celebration? Nil. Nausea? Nil. Back at Farnborough, Lewis has just completed his final session in the dreaded black box. Want a drink? No, I'm okay. You're all right. Yeah. So, Lewis, here we have the chart, and I think it only tells you something that you know already about yourself, namely that you've done really extraordinarily well, that there's been a steady progression all the way from uh, a motion dose that you tolerated to about 100 to begin with all the way up to 700 now. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a startlingly good increase. You should be proud of that. It isn't very much like an aeroplane, but we know that uh, if you can do it for that device, you can also do it for an aeroplane. Good, good. Well, that's, that's, that's reassuring to know, definitely, from my point of view. So it's good news. Lewis, though, hasn't flown for two months. Now it's back to the cardboard cockpit. He can now tolerate the machines on the ground. They don't make him sick. But it's how he reacts in the air that will decide his future. Lewis moves on to the School of Aviation Medicine at Boscombe Down. Yeah, it's good. It's good to be back in the flying environment, definitely. I've, uh, I've missed it. Here, you will have to endure some extreme flying to see if the sickness recurs. This is an important moment for Lewis. No reaction means a clean bill of health. Nausea and sickness at this stage will call his future as a fast jet pilot into question. is battered by G-force in the skies above Hampshire. Good. Yeah, good fun, good trip. Very productive. So, any of these symptoms you get then? Dizziness? No. Bodily warmth? No. Headache? No. Sweating? No. Stomach awareness? Yeah, mild. Increased salivation? No. Nausea? No. Excellent. Okay. So that's good. 
I got a, a, a few symptoms at the end of Squirrelly the Bulls aerobatics, just because I'm, I'm not flying, so I don't know, you know what, what kind of motion's coming next, if you like. But I recovered really quickly, which is what, we're, what we were trying to achieve, really. Um, and then was able to carry on and do, do more stuff. So, yeah, successful sorting, definitely. Lewis has survived. He's given the all clear to return to Valley and resume his fast jet training. Well, I've been back three days. I've had three trips so far, and they've all gone pretty well with you know, no, no sickness at all. And in fact, I feel much more sort of clear headed and, and ahead of the game when in, in the air, hmm. which has been really, really good. And I'm really pleased. That that's you know, it's the course has had that much of an effect. Lewis is taken out to the sick bin. He now joins a new group of pilots near the start of their training. Mark, Rich, and Dave have leaped ahead in his absence and are just two hurdles away from finishing with the squadron. It was quite sad to see that my friends have you know from my original course have now gone on and doing other things. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm excited about being back here and, and catching up with them. I'm only three months adrift, I think, and that's, uh, in the grand scheme of things, that's, that's not very much, is it? The Red Arrows fly into Valley to rehearse their summer display in the Anglesey skies. Their arrival offers the pilots a rare break in training. The Red Arrow pilots are wearing green flying suits because the display is still being shaped. Only when it's perfect will they be allowed to change into their iconic red suits. Uh, turning right, cross 1-9 and on at the threshold of 1-4. And we'll line up, please, for a display takeoff. The Red Arrows are no strangers to Valley. All of them were students here once. And they too, no doubt, struggled with battle turns, navigation and formation flying. But now they're some of the best pilots in the world. It's the sort of thing that you always um so we grow up thinking, oh, the, the better you become as a pilot, the, the less impressed you'll be by the Red Arrows, but to totally the opposite way. Now that I'm flying the Hawk and know how to formate it, you see this and you're ten times more impressed because you know actually literally how difficult it is. combat pilot, the pilots endure the centrifuge. We meet the man who scares the birds. And the pilots face their final hurdle at 2.08. Find out if you've got what it takes to become a fighter pilot, visit bbc.co.uk slash combat pilot. And this week's squadron leader Mark Byrne from RAF Valley will be answering your questions. <laughs>